This is lecture 21 of ECE 503. So, so far what we've looked at in the last couple of lectures are structures of discrete time systems, how we can arrange like um, uh, the delay elements, the adders, the multipliers, how we look at the flow of information as it goes from the input to the output, and ways of manipulating that information to achieve some sort of transfer function. What we're going to be looking at in this lecture is the idea that we can put this transfer function to good use. So, and one of those good uses is filtering. So what is filtering? Just like you filter water, right? Oh, I know, electrical engineers hate when we use analogies of like electricity to water. But okay, I'm guilty, I'm using water. Um, but it's exactly that. If you have water, like I'm not sure how many of you like Worcester water, I think it's not that bad. I like that much iron in my water. But um, when, you, when you filter something like water, you're taking something out and you're only keeping something that's desired, right? If you ask my wife, she thinks that West Boylston water is so awful. It's like, oh, that's bathroom water. You don't want to touch that. And always goes to our fridge, which uses almost the exact same water with exception of a paper filter with the water going through, to the point where it's like, oh, I want tea. Takes the filtered water, puts it into the kettle, boils that. I'm like, I, I give up. Oh, and our dog also gets that filtered water, too. Uh, but, you know, he's like our baby. Anyways. <clears throat> So filtering has a specific, has a very specific objective, which is, in this case, in electrical engineering sense, we want to extract certain types of information at specific frequencies, and we want to discard other frequencies, other bits of information. So what we're going to look at is, we're going to be looking at, in this lecture, is the lingua franca of filtering. So this... Oh, this is filtering. No, just kidding. So this here, this slide here, you're going to need to be familiar with this because when you play with MATLAB, when you play with whatever sort of filter <coughs> design tool, or if you look in your textbook, this is the language that folks speak when they talk about, at least for starters, what people talk about when they talk about filtering. So there are several things that you should pay attention to, so, and they are important. What happens is, so we know that this region here is called the passband. Why? Because it's passing through specific frequencies of that signal. And this here is called the stop band because it's stopping certain frequencies from passing through. There's this middle guy here called the transition band. And this guy, because remember that in the real world, we don't have brick wall filters. So that's another terminology some folks use, brick wall filters. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen brick walls, maybe. What happens is brick walls tend to be, unless they're designed by me, to be pretty straight. So pass band, boom, stop band, with, and it's a vertical wall. In reality, it's almost impossible to achieve that sort of transition. So what we end up having is this little, little region in the frequency domain of our filter that it's going from pass band to stop band and it's transitioning from one to the other. So it's transitioning from letting everything go to letting nothing go. But wait, there's more. What happens is inside the pass band, it's not perfectly flat. There's something there. There's a ripple. I don't know, every time I see that I think of chips. You know, like rippled chips. So, anyways, you have the pass band ripple, you got the stop band ripple. Those as well are practical considerations. In the real world, brick wall, remember? Boop, boop, boop. In the real world, ripple, 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 non negligible transition, ripple, ripple, ripple. And that, that's just due to how, designing, how we end up designing our filters, right? They're not going to be perfect. So we have our pass band ripple, our stop band ripple, our transition band, we have our pass band, we have our stop band. And what we find is that there are trade-offs that face us, right? If we try and make that, that transition band as narrow as possible, we're going to pay the piper somewhere else. We might have a higher transition, uh, we might have a higher pass band ripple and a higher stop band ripple. If we make those perfectly smooth, 
that means we're going to have to have a very wide transition band. There's, there's all these sort of different forces that are going on in order to make these decisions on designing your filter. All right? Oh, and by the way, like, um, if you really, like, you know, what you'll find is this might look cool, but it, mu it will actually be even cooler if you do this in the log domain. Okay? So if you take the 20, 20 log 10 of the magnitude response, then you'll really see some ripples. You'll see the characteristics of your filter design. All right? Perhaps at the end of this lecture, what I'll do is if, do we have MATLAB on this? I think we do. <sighs> okay, so, oh, I hope I don't have to activate it. So we'll, we'll go back to it in a second, okay? Boom. Okay, MATLAB. Down. Okay. So things that you need to take into consideration. Causality. So if you're looking at like something that needs to operate in real time, it's got to be causal. Anti-causal, you must have a time machine, right? Because uh, in order to be, no, okay, boop, I take that back. There's anti-causal and there's non-causal. Anti-causal, you're totally looking to the future and you're not looking at present or past. Non-causal means you're looking at anything, but you're in particular also looking at the future, right? There's filter order. So this is also really important. Usually, we want to keep the filter order, you know, reasonable. Um, you know, because like for instance, what you're going to discover is that if you're just playing with FIR filters and you want really nice characteristics, um, and the more degrees of freedom that you have with many of these coefficients, what's going to end up happening is that you're going to have to choose a very high filter order, which will result in lots of delay elements which will cause a lot of delay in your information propagating through. It's going to be a lot of hardware costs. It's just not a lot of fun. At the same time, uh, you, want, you really do want to minimize that transition bandwidth, but that's going to be expense of your pass band and stop band ripples. And so those two kind of fight with each other. So what ends up happening is you're going to need to make design choices on stop band, pass band ripples, filter order, and transition bandwidth in order to get, you know, the filter that you want. Oh, and let me not even start about if, if you have to make it fixed point versus floating point. Because when you go into that, uh, now that's where the, you know, the money is. So, let's look at FIR filters for a moment. So, we saw this before. The FIR filter, right, tap delay line, this guy right here is our tap delay line. Just as before. We have, first of all, the non-delayed element multiplied by coefficient b0, first delayed element multiplied by coefficient b1, b2, b3, b4, all the way to bm minus 1. So these b's are our filter coefficients. Those are the things that we design, right? And also the number of those, fil those filter coefficients in an FIR filter dictate the filter order. In this case, I have an FIR filter of order M. I'm trying to make sure my nasal sounds M rather than N. <laughs> so, what ends up happening is those coefficients, B0 to Bm minus 1, those coefficients define our filter, right, in our tap delay line. And what's interesting, so here's a few potpourri items to talk about when we deal with filters, especially when they're FIR filters, there's something called linear phase. I think we talked about that before, right? So what happens is when we have linear phase, what happens when we have linear phase? We have a constant group delay. We saw this many lectures ago, remember? When we looked at the phase response of different systems and they have a phase response that's linear, and we knew that the group delay is the derivative of the linear phase and frequency. What happens? We have a constant when we have linear phase, which means that all information across all frequency are getting delayed at the exact same time as they're going from the input to the output, which is great because if we don't have constant group delay, it becomes a mess. 
because then different frequency elements pass through sooner rather than other frequency elements. Really messy stuff. But if our filter, if, if our FIR filter's linear phase, what property does it have? The coefficients are either symmetric or anti-symmetric. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Seriously. I'm laughing, but I'm, I'm really, really serious. When we have a linear phase FIR filter, what ends up happening is our, our H, our, um, our impulse response, has an anti-symmetric or a symmetric response. Either one will produce a linear phase response. Okay? So in the, freq and so in, in the frequency domain, we have this representation here. So either plus or minus H of Z will give us this expression here, which is delayed by M minus 1 and h z to the minus 1. So what this guy implies, what does this guy imply? When we have linear phase and we have this expression here, so if we do the math and we get this expression, what do we have? We have, con we have roots, right? We have roots not only at z, but also at z 1 over z. So this guy is really important because look what happens. If we look at the pole 0 plot, what we have is, first of all, if we're lucky, we should be lucky, we should have it. What happens is we have conjugate zeros and poles. More importantly, so what does conjugate mean? means on the x-axis we have these roots that are spaced out evenly on the upper and lower part of the z-plane, opposite each other from the x-axis. More importantly, around the unit circle, we'll have this root here at z1, and we'll have another root at 1 over z1. So a linear phase FIR filter will have this property. Conjugate roots, and around the unit circle, there's this weird 1 over z1 and z1. So you have something where you have both this, and this, and that, around the unit circle, what you've got there are telltale, telltale signs of a linear phase FIR filter. Woohoo! Nice. And so now what happens is if we have a symmetric filter, let's, let's go through the math. What do we get? If we go through the math, what this tells me, if it's symmetric, is that h of n is equal to h of m minus 1 minus n. Frequency response, folks, what is it? It's h of omega is equal to hr of omega, the real part of h omega, e to the min j minus j omega m minus 1 divided by 2. We can re-express that, hr of omega, and what we'll find is that if m is odd or m is even, we get these two expressions here. So if m is odd, we have this weird term in the middle that because it, it you know, uh, and if we have, on the other hand, is if m is even. So, so if we have this odd guy, there's no symmetry, so we have to count that guy out somehow. If m is even, we don't have to worry about this intermediate term. And cosine, well, that should be a dead giveaway. And as for the phase characteristics, what you'll have is the phase, depending on what hr is, is it plus, is it above zero, is it a non-negative number, or is it a negative number, you'll have either a phase response that is either minus omega, m minus 1 divided by 2, or minus omega, m minus 1 divided by 2, plus m, the filter order. Okay? Likewise, our anti-symmetric Almost, we do the, almost the same exact mathematical rigmarole in order to get these answers. But, but really, what's really powerful about all of this okay, is this idea of like, you know, designing filters and, and being able to understand how they work in the frequency domain. So, so for instance, let's, let's actually play with MATLAB. I haven't prepared this, so... 
It's going to be a little bit fun, so bear with me. So suppose I want to make an FIR filter. How would I do that? So one, one of several things you can do, like let's say, um, hmm. So one thing you can do is you can create, um, like, you know, so several things you have is you have, um, in the time domain, you can use the function. Yeah, so you can use something like filter to filter in the time domain. And hopefully some of you have already looked at that. You can also play in the frequency domain. And you can use things like the FFT, right? So one thing that MATLAB does, and I have to figure out if it's still there. So filter design toolbox. So this is actually FDA tool. OK, so that's what's called. FDA, I, FDA tool. So it has this nice, cool GUI. So if you want to design your own filters and such, OK, please do not show me that again. Close. So this, I know, it's like, you know, just, just like, boom. It's Adobe Acrobat. Do you wish to upgrade? No. So what happens is this is actually, like, you know, you can do things by brute force. Or what you can do is this actually is pretty cool. I'm, uh, so I'm not trying to sell you guys on FDA tool. But if you want something quick and easy, um, first of all, notice that the interface here, just as before, you know, the pass band ripple, the stop band ripple, your transition band, all of these are kind of critical components for your basic filter design, right? So in this tool, you can do a variety of things. So first of all, do you want low pass? Um, do you, uh, and, and there are a variety of those. Do you want high pass? Oy, there we go. It's a little slow. In which case, you almost have the exact same parameters. Uh, perhaps you want band stop or band pass. In which case, you can design, you know, all you have is you can set the specs. And what you'll notice is that if you play around, so here's filter order. So let's say we play with low pass. Let's say it's FIR, and there's a variety of different types of FIR filters. What does equi-ripple mean? Hmm? Can you ripple to the same? Mm-hmm. Yep. And then there are a few other types of types of FIR filters out there. So let's say, if you notice, look how important they even have a radio button just for minimum order. But let's say I want to muck around. So let's say I want to play with a filter. That is 300 in order. Let's just go crazy. OK? Um, and then I can choose a variety of other types of um, you know, uh, parameters and functions. I can specify the frequency and such. So what I can do with this tool is I can also, let's say, can I do it graphically? No. So what I can do is I can specify where the, 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 where the, uh, pa uh, the stop band and the pass band Start. So let's say I'm normalizing by that, but let's say I bring it down to, so I can specify if this is my sampling frequency. Hmm. OK. And then I can, oh, does it, it doesn't refresh, does it? OK. So now what I can do is uh, enter the weight value for each band below. So here's where I can, let's say, really emphasize And then we'll leave that as, as one. And then what I, all I do is I say design filter. And it's thinking, OK. Ah, oh, failed to rounding error. I wonder what that could be. So what happens is here is now like, can I zoom in? No. So what you can do is, like this is what I'm talking about in terms of doing everything in log. Can I actually set that in non-logarithm? Yeah. So that's the magnitude response. That's the phase response. Magnitude and phase responses you can superimpose on one another. I don't think this gives me an option to do to do anything else, but but yeah. So what happens is from this, you can then obtain, let's say, the filter coefficients from this design. Um, and again, you can look at the magnitude response and say, is that what you want or not? So let's say now I, I change, change it to 51 as a filter order. Um, suppose I 
bring this back to default or close to it. So no, like that. Um, we keep that to one. We choose the equi ripple. Yeah. So this is like let's say if I didn't do something crazy like making a three hundred order filter and such, what you've noticed is that you know your equi ripple design. You have your pass band and you have your stop band ripples. So what we're looking at is in the logarithm domain, right? So this is in dB, so it's 20 log 10 of whatever this, uh, the magnitude of your frequency response is. And so reason why we look at this in particular in this domain is this information here, these very deep nulls, those are something that's kind of important because that tells me, okay, there's a lot of attenuation happening at those specific points, right? So. And at the same time, it shows a little bit of detail in terms of what's happening in the passband. But of course, it's a little bit skewed. Because what logarithm does great is that it emphasizes uh, very small details, but not so great with very large ones. So here, what, what I've just done, assuming a, f a sampling frequency of 48,000 hertz, is that I've essentially created a filter where my passband stops at 9,000 hertz and my stop band stops at around um, uh, uh, 10,000 hertz. And then the rest of it, here's my stop band, here's my pass band, here's my transition band of 1,000 hertz. Uh, and I've weighed my pass band and I've weighed my stop band accordingly. Now, I can mess around with this. Like, for instance, I can change around the, the weighting. So let's say I do 0.5 and just re redraw this guy, design filter. And now I can actually tweak stuff. So let's say I do that. So now what you've noticed is that I'm playing around a little bit with the pass, the, eh, the weighting of the passband ripple. And what ultimately what I'm doing is, let's say it fits some sort of spec, right? So in the case of equi ripple, it's pretty straightforward. Let's say I use something else, like least squares. Design filter. So what least squares will do, it, it uses a different optimization routine for making the filter design. So equi ripple, it says the ripples must be, right? In the case of the least squares, it's trying to optimize according to what I'm specifying in terms of keeping the stop band and, and pass band ripples to a minimum and trying to fit with the minimal amount of error uh, given my specification. And what ends up happening is, you notice that it's no longer equi ripple in the stop band or in the pass band. And then there are a variety of other um, type of um, blah, uh, filter design techniques out there. So you have constrained equi ripple, constant band equi ripple, and the like. You also have, let's say, things like IR filters, which we won't talk about too much yet. But notice if I change the filter order. So let's go back to equi ripple, because I love equi ripple. And then I increase it to, let's say, 101. <coughs> Notice that the higher my filter order, I also get a lot more favorable filter characteristics out of this as well, right? So, so that, I think, so again, like this is something that you can enjoy using. It's nice, it's graphical. Um, of course, if you can do it in raw MATLAB, that would be wonderful. All the GUI does is essentially takes that raw MATLAB functions that's underneath it anyway and just visualizes it in the GUI, right? So if, if any of you are trying to figure out why am I not getting this desired response, you just try it out here and it's like, oh, that's why. But, and, and the nice thing about this thing is that you can always export your coefficients afterwards, right? But if you want to do it from scratch, uh, there are a number of tools that you can use in order to design in the MATLAB environment your, your, your actual filter systems. All right? Okay. So with that, that concludes lecture 21 of ECE uh, 503. Okay. All right. So what we've just seen is